It's special guest time. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Rachel Yankee. Rachel is the most capped England player and Arsenal lady legend. She's also managed London Bees and represented Great Britain in the 2012 Olympics. She is a true pioneer of the women's game and we're very excited to learn more about her experience growing up with football. So welcome, Rachel. Thank you, Viv. Delighted you can join us. So let's get straight into it. How did you fall in love with the game of football? Oh, gosh. Um, game of football? I think I fell in love with sport first. Um, I think my mum was, was very, uh, very open to me and my older brother playing lots of different games and doing lots of different sports, sporting activities. I remember us doing swimming, which I wasn't so keen on, um, but gymnastics was really big when I was small. Um, we both, my, myself and my older brother, were at a running club, but I think it was football that, that really gripped me, um, football that that really, you know, gave me that buzz and made me want to go out and play. So, um, yeah, always down the park, always at the end of the street, wherever there was somewhere with someone with a football, you could find me. That, that's a re really interesting because um, what you talk about there is a really supportive family that encourage you to play sport, and you could really have gone to any sport, uh, but football for many reasons. Some of the reasons you just gave me is because you can just go to the end of the street or you can go to the park. Yeah, I think so. I think with, um, I think with the other sports, I mean, gymnastics, I really, I really liked and I was really good at it, but then I didn't like what we wore. And I know that seems really uh, sort of trivial, but I didn't like wearing the leotard and stuff like that. I think I got to, I was only young, but I was sort of maybe a little bit body conscious um, with the running. I used to run for Highgate Harriers um, and I used to do the 800 meters, which I'm sure many of my teammates would not believe. I was more, I, they probably thought I was more of a sprinter. But um, and then a one one time I was put the, in by a coach to do the 1500 and it was just too far for me. And that and it was at that point that I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. And I think. Where my mum was really supportive is that she allowed me to make my own choices um, and didn't sort of push me or force me um, into, into one sport or, or, or something that I didn't want to do. And uh, I know that when I joined um, definitely a girls team, uh, it was there was a lot of the dads at the football games instructing their daughters on what to do and how to do it. And because my mum, I mean, she knew about football. Her dad sort of took her, um, you know, to games and let her watch the watch football. But um, she she wasn't that she wasn't that bothered. She all she cared about is that I was having fun. So mm. you know, she was just happy that I came off the pitch with a smile on my face, and and that was the biggest thing. You know, Rachel, you made some really good points there that, about why you ended up in football. You talked about the leotard uh, and the clothing you have to wear in gymnastics, and that's not trivial because it's one of the barriers that put girls off sport, what they have to wear or how, how mm. the body looks when they're playing sport. And then you, you talked, talked about um, pushy parents, parents that are pushy, mm. a coach making you do something you didn't want to do. So great examples of, of, of why you didn't choose those sports but but I can tell the passions there for football so I want to know a little bit more now can you tell us a bit more about your experience playing football from I think it was from about eight years old <laughs> yeah yeah I mean yeah the story always comes up and now that I'm an adult I, I get a bit embarrassed about it but as a kid I didn't really see that it was wrong or or anything unreasonable about it but um Two friends of mine that lived across the road, they, they were joining a football team that uh, one of the parents at their school had set up. Uh, they asked me if I wanted to join. I was like, yeah, brilliant. You know, let's go. And then they sort of said, oh, well, it's a it's a boys team. There's no other girls. So um, I think it was my friend Lawrence was like, well, my initials spell out the word Ray or the name Ray. So he was kind of like, well, we'll just call you Ray and we'll just pretend. Um I had short hair, you know, when they used to go to the barbers, I used to go with them. So I was very much a tomboy and, and that was just me. So um, 
pretending to be a boy and joining the team was quite easy. The manager, he knew that I was a girl. Um, he really didn't have a problem with me playing. Uh, but all pretty much all the other players thought that I was Ray, this young boy <laughs> playing football. But um, I think that's the thing with kids is that really it didn't matter um, whether I was a boy or a girl. It was just whether I was good enough. And I was good enough. Um, I obviously just pretended and it made it a whole lot easier for me as a person. I just felt like I fitted in to the to the boys game, to, to everything that they were doing. Um, and when I got slightly older and wasn't allowed to play in that boys team and, and was moved on to a girls team, I felt really out of place, which kind of doesn't make sense. But I felt like in the boys team, I could kind of be myself, where in the girls team, I felt that every opponent that we played against and parents that were on the sideline, you know, they said some quite horrible things, to be honest, because I looked like a boy the way that I played football, everybody sort of said, you know, you play like a boy. Why is this boy playing in the girls team? So I took a lot more abuse and probably hid a lot of things from my mum at that point, playing in the um, playing in the playing in the girls team where I felt a lot free, a lot more freer uh, playing for the boys. Wow, that is a powerful story, Rachel. <laughs> Uh, and I mean, you, you talk about it um, in such an open way, but that's a dreadful thing that you have to pretend to be a boy in order to play the game you love. And uh, hopefully we've moved on significantly now. Uh, yeah. girls, girls get the, the opportunities they deserve at that young age. Um, but I would say the one positive you're saying from all of that is your level of skill and your abilities uh, developed during that time that you were playing as Ray and actually perhaps expectations of um, girls in a girls team uh, weren't high enough for you in, because you were outperforming them. Yeah I mean I went, well the girls team that I went to I was pretty amazed at, um, at how many girls one how many girls played and two how good they were but mm. at the boys team it did, um, yeah, I did everything and the coaches didn't treat me any differently because sometimes people treat girls differently or uh, go easy on girls. I, I wasn't treated any, any, any differently to any other boy. And I kind of liked that. Um, you know, if we, if we, I don't know, failed at a task and the, and the, then the, the forfeit was doing press ups. So I was down there doing press ups and no one was saying, oh, do, you know, girls press ups or easier press ups. I, I was doing exactly the same as the boys. And um, yeah, I, I, felt, I felt part of that. So I quite liked it. Yeah. And you, you made a really interesting comment in that. You, you talked about the consistency of approach of the coach, that you weren't treated differently, which kind of leads me on to my next question for you is, you, you'll have had a number of coaches uh, throughout your playing career. What are some of your favourite memories of a coach that you've worked with? Oh, gosh. Um, I think I'm, I'm often asked who was the best coach, and I find that a really difficult um, question to answer because when I think about what I liked and the qualities of, of the coaches, the majority of the ones that spring to mind are the ones that really cared. Um, cared about you as a person obviously we go onto the football pitch we all want to try our best we all want to win but um, you know there's still the person in you and the coaches you know it, it sort of spring to mind that once you if you weren't for instance when I was at Arsenal um, Vic Akers was our manager there and I had the opportunity um, this was women's football in this country has gone a little bit different different uh, now but it's fully professional now but it wasn't at one point and then I had the opportunity to join Fulham who were like two leagues below um, but they had gone professional so I left Arsenal a bigger club a bigger name to join Fulham with what I thought was and what I saw was a bigger opportunity because I was going to be a professional but Vic Akers always said you know Basically, he didn't agree with me going there and didn't think it was a good move for me, but I was always welcome back. And that, to me, sort of 
um, really pinned down the fact that, you know, he cared about me as a person. He'd always sort of, you know, speak to me whether I was playing for him or not. Um, so I think those elements and mm. my first coach in that boys team, uh, Tony Chelsea, he he could have been like, pretty much any other coach and said no this is a boys team you're not joining but he saw no reason he was he was a painter and decorator he wasn't a football coach he was a volunteer who created a team because his son wanted to play and he saw no reason that I shouldn't be able to play as well and you know he treated me no different um he probably protected me more uh, because when, when the leagues and everybody said that I couldn't play, it was actually him that went and found me a girls team to play for because it wasn't social media mm-hmm. and it wasn't so easy to find out information. He found me somewhere. He made sure I got there on the first day of training. Um, so, so really without him and the fact that he actually cared about the person and wanted to see me succeed, um, you know, who knows if I would have actually gone any further into football. Great example. And I think that's been echoed throughout um, the whole of this webinar, because who'd have talked about uh, the individual and the social care? And Ambo talked about connecting and valuing the individual as well. And you're talking about coaches looking at you as a person, not just a football player. So I've got one final question. I could talk all afternoon. <laughs> I have one final question for you. You've had such an illustrious career. Uh, too many things to mention really what are you most proud of Rachel um obviously when you when you walk on the football pitch you want to win you want to score goals you want to play well as a team so so those things you aim for but um I'm probably most proud of um I set up a grassroots football team and um I worked I set up my own coaching business um working in in Brent and Harrow uh which is in London um coaching in primary schools and coaching both boys and girls uh, to try and just teach them the values that sport can bring them, their life skills, no matter whether they were, whether they were any good or going on to succeed um, or be a professional, but just saying that, you know, there, there's so many life skills that I've got out of football and which you guys could too. And um, in 2014, I was awarded an OBE for football and also services to the youth game. So that's probably the proudest thing because I, I wasn't expected. You, you don't, I wasn't trying to get that. Where on the football pitch, I was always trying to, trying to win or trying to score a goal. But, but that was given and, and recognised that uh, myself and all the other coaches that we well worked with, we'd actually done a really good thing. Wow. What a great way to, to end our conversation. Thank you for all you do for the young people in London. Uh, Rachel Yankee OBE, thank you so much for being our special guest. Thank you for having me.